Okay, tonight we're going to be in Amos chapter 7, and we'll probably finish up uh, Amos chapter 7 and 8 tonight, and then next Wednesday night we'll look at chapter 9, which is the promise of future restoration, and that will be the, the close of Daniel, and we'll move on to the next in the chronological order of the Minor Prophets, but tonight we'll be in chapter 7, and chapter 7 begins a the final section of the book of Amos, and it uh, kind of weird. And uh, this section, it, it is Amos is given five visions from the Lord, five things he sees, and after the first three, they're interrupted by an accusation that he gets from a priest named Amaziah. So apparently the Lord gave him three of these visions. He went and reported them to Amaziah and to Jeroboam the second. And Amaziah didn't like it. And so he comes against um, Amos, and we'll look at that in just a minute. And then he gets the last uh, three, uh, the last two visions from the Lord. And then he goes into chapter 9. So as we go through this, also, I want you to notice a couple of things in these, these visions that he gets from the Lord, and especially like just beginning with verse 1 of chapter 7, the first three words, at least in the CSB, may be a little bit different in yours, but it says the Lord God. And this is the first time this is used in the book of Amos, and he uses it for every one of the prophecies, the Lord God. And if you're reading from the NIV, and I like this, it's translated the sovereign God. And, and I like that because the Lord is telling him, remember this is a, a judgment of, of, of final judgment, a prophecy of final judgment. This is it, the Lord said, I'm done with them. And we're going to see that in one of these visions here in a minute. And so he changes his name. And he changes it to what he says here in the Christian standard, the Lord God. If you look in the front of your Bible again, as I told you before, you'll, you'll have somewhere in there that they've got in the preface that they've got outlined how they translate various Hebrew names of God. And this one is Adonai Elohim is what it is. And Adonai means Lord or Master. And then Elohim means God or used sometime in the Old Testament as Yahweh, which is the personal name for God to the Jews. It's, it's their covenant name. And then the second thing that I want you to notice as we go through these visions is that God starts to use the phrase, my people. And he hasn't used that earlier in all of the prophecies. But now that he comes to these visions of, of the final judgment, this is what's going to happen, he begins to call them my people. And I think there's a couple of reasons for that, and, and we're going to see it as we get into. But if you'll notice in verse 2, let's, let's read verse 1 and 2. Then the Lord God showed me this. He was forming a swarm of locusts at the time that the spring crop first began to sprout, and afterward, after the cutting of the king's hay. And when the locust finished eating the vegetation, I said, Lord God, Please forgive, how shall Jacob survive since he is so small? And then verse 3, the Lord relented concerning this. It will not happen, he said. So I think the reason that he switches to the name, the sovereign Lord, or the sovereign Jehovah, personal God, Yahweh, and then he starts using the phrase, my people, is because this is final judgment and because he wants them to understand that even though all of this judgment's fixing to come on you, and as a nation you're going to be destroyed, you're going to be taken out of the country, everything you've got's destroyed, you're still my people. And we're going to see that when we get to chapter 9 when he gives them the, uh, the, the prophecy of, of final restoration in the end days. And so I think he's making a statement to them, and he's wanting them to understand that, yes, it looks like that, that I've turned my back on you, which he has, and we'll see that. He's taken his hand of protection off of them. He's given them over to their enemies, but they're still his people. And, and even though all of this is happening to them, he still 
has future plans for them. He still has a purpose for the nation Israel. And remember, at this time, the Messiah hasn't been born yet. And that's what Israel was chosen for, was for the Messiah to come through them, come through the line of the seed of Abraham. And so he uses those two words. He changes the way he addresses them, and he changes what he calls them to show them that he's still their God, even though they've got to face judgment, even though they've got to answer for their sin, he's still their God. And we can take uh, encouragement from that because when we go through times and we go through difficulties, I spoke with a lady uh, a couple of days ago, and she was just telling me um, it, it was just terrible, the things she was going through, the things that she was facing, and she just didn't know how she was going to make it. How could she stand up at her age to, to all of these difficulties? And then she stopped and she just said, but you know what? He, she said, the Lord's with me. He'll be with me. And so there are times that it does feel like that we are abandoned. There are times that it feels like that we, we are alone and we're having to face all of these things by ourselves. But the Lord is there. And on the other hand, there are times that we have to suffer the consequences of our sin. Even though we're forgiven. Even though... Romans chapter 8 verse 1 will never be called into account in future judgment for our sin. We still have to face the consequences here in this world many times of our sin. Uh, it, I could use so many examples and I don't really know what would be the best to do. But I remember an old preacher way back when he used this and I've been using it ever since. He said, you know, he said it's not God's will for you to go cut your arm off. But he said you can do it. If you want to, but it says you're going to have to suffer the consequences the rest of your life living without your arm. And sometimes we do things. Sometimes we say things we shouldn't. We offend people. We just do the wrong thing. And even though we're convicted and we confess, God forgives us, sometime there are still consequences to what we've done. And we have to deal with those. So here in verses 1 through 3, he has the first vision. It's the vision of the locust. And locusts in the Old Testament, any time that God uses locusts as a judgment, pretty much any time locusts show up, it's bad. And they pretty much, they just destroy everything. And Amos knows that. And he knows that when God speaks a judgment and it's locust, and especially if you look back through Israel's history, all the way back to Egypt, and then God used locust in Egypt, he knows that it's going to be bad. And so he begins to cry out to God, and he says, Lord God, if, if this really happens, he says, Jacob. And notice he didn't say Israel. He didn't say the northern kingdom. He said, Jacob will not survive because they're so small. Well, look at two things at that. Number one, right now in Amos' day when this is happening, Israel is at its height, at its political height. Their military strength is, is powerful. They've taken some other countries around them. We saw that, uh, I think, last Wednesday night. Uh, they're rich. The, that's part of their problem is the people have gotten so rich that they're just complacent and they think, well, nothing's, nothing can happen to us. You know, we're Israel, we're rich, we've got a mighty army. But in the face of this locust invasion that the sovereign God is about to send, Amos knows they can't stand. And he knows that everything that they have is going to be destroyed. And he points out that this is going to happen after the first harvest, which went to the king to supply the military animals, and now it's time for the second harvest, and if they don't get that second harvest, that's what all the people are going to eat the rest of the year. And if they don't get this second harvest, there won't be another harvest until next year. And so he knows that they'll be without food. They'll be in a famine. And so he begins to pray, and he calls them Jacob. And when he does this, He's reminding God of the covenant that he made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's reminding God. He's saying, look, 
I know the people are bad. I know that everything that you've told me in these first six chapters are true. Your judgment is righteous, but these are your covenant people. And then it says, so God said, okay, I'll withhold this. Now notice, he doesn't say, I'll withhold judgment. When you get to the third vision, you'll see judgment is still coming. But he says, I'll withhold this judgment. They won't have to suffer this. And then he begins in the, the uh, second one, verses 4 through 5. And he says, the Lord God showed me this. The Lord God was calling for a judgment by fire. And it consumed the great deep and devoured the land. Then I said, Lord God, please stop. How will Jacob survive since he is so small? And the Lord relented concerning this. And he said, this will not happen either, said the Lord God. So again, he sees a, a devouring fire. And he says that the fire was so bad that it destroyed the great deep. We would call that the, the water table that, that's underneath. And because that's going to dry up, then all the streams, all the rivers, all the creeks are going to dry up. So there's going to be nothing to stop this fire. It's just going to, when it starts, it's just going to go through the country like, like it's tender because there's no water there. And again, Amos cries out. And again, he uses that covenant name. And again, God relents. So this is like God saying almost, look, you're going to go to hell but before you get there, I'm, I'm going to leave you alone. You've rejected me, but I'm, I'm just going to leave you alone in this life because you're going to hell anyway. Well, you think, well, that, that's awfully gracious of God. Well, think about it like this. And I don't know if Amos was thinking about this or not. What we saw, especially in chapter 1 and then in chapter 3, remember, I believe it was chapter 3, chapter 4. Where God, beginning in verse 6, down through verse 13, list all of these things. And he said, he said, look, he said, I did this. I gave rain to one city, didn't let it rain on another. So one city had crops, one didn't. I, I, I caused a drought. And then he said, yet you did not turn to me. And then he, he drops down and he said, I struck you with blight and mildew and locusts devoured. And he said, yet you did not return to me. And he goes on four times. And so I'm wondering if maybe Amos should have waited and let these judgments come on Israel and maybe it would have got their attention. Maybe after the, the locusts came through and then the flood came through, maybe somebody would have woke up and said, hey, God may be telling us something. Judgment's coming on us and maybe they would have repented, but they didn't. And Amos didn't go that route. Amos chose to seek to spare them of these judgments that were coming. And then the third judgment starts in verse 7, and it's the plumb line judgment. And this is where we see that, that the sentence hasn't changed. Maybe what's going to happen leading up to the sentence has changed. But destruction is still coming. And so beginning in verse 7, he said, he showed me this. The Lord was standing there by a vertical wall with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord asked me, what do you see, Amos? And I replied, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, I am setting a plumb line among my people Israel, and I will no longer spare them. There's the final judgment. Maybe they missed a, a couple of little things along the way, but final judgment's coming. Isaac's high places will be deserted. Now the Lord reverts to a covenant name, Isaac. He doesn't call him Israel. He says, now, Isaac. So he's saying, look, I made a covenant with them, and I think that's what the plumb line was, was the covenant, was the law that the Lord was holding. He said, Isaac's high places will be deserted, and Israel's sanctuaries will be in ruins, and I will raise up against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. So the Lord is standing there, and he's holding the plumb line. Now, they used the plumb line... Everybody knows what it is to, to build a wall, make sure it was straight, make sure it stood up. But they also used the plumb line on a wall that had already been built to see if it had settled and was leaning and to see how much it was leaning. And if it was leaning too much, they'd tear it down and rebuild. And I think that's what God's doing. He's not building a wall. 
He's holding it up to see if the wall is still on its foundation and standing straight. And obviously, it's not. And if the wall is, as he goes back to Isaac, if the wall is the covenant, the law that he had given them, then they're leaning way away. I mean, we're talking almost fall down leaning. And I believe that's what the picture is here. And that's why he's telling Amos, he said, look, he said, the judgment's final. He says, I will no longer spare them. And then notice a couple of things in verse 9. Notice that when he says Israel's sanctuaries, it's plural. Israel's high places, it's plural. Okay, this is the northern kingdom. They don't have Jerusalem and they don't have the temple in Jerusalem. So he's not talking about the temple. He's talking about the high places, the sanctuaries that they've set up for false gods. And this is going to play in important here in just a few minutes. But if you'll remember, back in uh, 1 Kings, when the kingdom split, after uh, Solomon died, his son Rehoboam took the kingdom. Rehoboam was a, was a bad guy. He didn't walk in the ways of his father Solomon or his grandfather David. And so the people got mad at him. Well, Jeroboam took advantage of this, and he took a whole bunch of people and went north and established the kingdom of Israel in Samaria, basically. So after a little while, while he was up there, he decided, you know what? He said, these people are Jews. And he said, if I don't do something, they're going to start going back to Jerusalem three times a year like they're supposed to, and they're going to realize that that's where God's at. That's where they're supposed to be worshiping. And so he goes to two places. He goes to Bethel, and then the other place, it just says he went to Dan. Okay, well, Dan is a, a territory, not a city, so it doesn't say exactly where he went. And he built two altars, two temples, and he put golden calves there, just like what they had at Mount Sinai after the Exodus. And he told Israel, he said, Israel, these are your gods. These are the ones that brought you up out of Egypt, and these are the ones that will sustain us and see us through. He set up a religious system almost identical to what was happening in Jerusalem, but rather than to the true God, it was to these false gods. The people loved it. He brought in priests. They, they set up a system, and, and everybody just loved it. And so when he says here, in verse uh, 9, Isaac's high places and Israel's sanctuaries, that's what he's talking about. He's talking about the, the false things that they've set up. And he says, I'm going to destroy them. Every one of them's coming down. And then notice again, verse 8, I am setting a plumb line among my people, Israel. He's reminding them who they are. He's reminding them of the covenant that they made with God. And remember, we've talked about this a couple of times. I preached on it one Sunday morning a couple of months ago. They agreed to the covenant at Sinai with Moses. And then when Joshua was about to die in Joshua chapter 24, he, after he had given them the promised land and divided it up, he told them the covenant again, reminded them of everything, and he said, choose you this day who you'll serve. And you remember they all said, oh, we'll serve the Lord. And you remember what Joshua said? Don't say that. You can't serve the Lord. He was trying to get them to throw themselves upon God's mercy and God's grace and tell the Lord, God, we can't do this. And I believe God would have answered them. But instead, we see a whole history of setting the law aside and then bringing it back, of going after false gods and then coming back, back and forth, back and forth. And so God reminds them, he says, look, we made a covenant, and you've broken it. And as a result of that, I will no longer spare you. And you're going to see here in just a few minutes that he's going to say something even worse than that. He's going to say that my hand is going to be against you. And, folks, that's, that's a scary thing when you think about God removing his hand of grace from you 
and sending his hand of wrath against you. Somebody might jump up and say, oh, but these are his people. God wouldn't do that to his people. Well, I'm reading it to you, and all you got to do is look back in recorded history, not biblical history, recorded history, and see that that's exactly what happened. And that's what happened to Israel in A.D. 70, and for almost 2,000 years, they were under God's hand of judgment, even though God watched over them for those 2,000 years and kept them as a people, his hand was against them. But then he brought them back, just like he promised he would, and he's bringing them back. And then beginning in verse 10 is Amaziah's opposition to Amos. I'm not going to read the whole thing, just the first couple of verses. Amos, the priest of Bethel, sent Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent word to King Jeroboam of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you, Right here in the house of Israel, the land cannot endure all his words. For Amos has said this, Jeroboam will die by the sword, and Israel will certainly go into exile from its homeland. Then Amaziah said to Amos, Go away, you seer, flee to the land of Judah, and earn your living, and give your prophecies there. But don't ever prophesy at Bethel again. Bethel was the place of, of one of the sanctuaries that Jeroboam had set up, and that's where also he had made his capital, and that's where his, his mansion was, his uh, kingdom that he ruled from. And he tells him, he says, Don't ever prophesy at Bethel again, for it is the king's sanctuary and a royal temple. So Amaziah doesn't like what's happening. You've got to remember that all of this time that, that Amos is prophesying, that there are probably hundreds of paid prophets that are also prophesying to Jeroboam and to Amaziah. And their message is, hey, it's great. You know, look look how we got it. it, it we're rich. We're powerful. God's blessing us, Jeroboam. You are the king of kings. You ain't got nothing to worry about. Just go on about your business. And then here comes Amos, and Amos says, Jeroboam, you're about to die by the sword, and the kingdom is going to be ripped from your hands, and all of your people are going to be taken away into captivity. Well, Amaziah realizes that he doesn't like this, but he also realizes that if Amos is right, that that's going to cut into his profit because he's the high priest, and he's just making money off of everything and everybody, and he's got all kinds of power, and so he moves about trying to stop Amos. And notice what he tells Amos. He says, look, you go back to the south and, and, and prophesy down there and earn your money, earn your keep down there. So he's accusing Amos of being a paid prophet, just like these other guys are. And Amos' answer is, he says, look, he said, I wasn't a prophet. I wasn't the son of a prophet. I hate it when preachers use that today because it, it just sounds kind of arrogant to me. Yeah, you are, because you're standing up there prophesying, so quit that. But anyway, Amos says, look, I have nothing to do with this. I was going about my business. I was tending my herds and tending my orchards. And the Lord told me to come say this. So Amaziah, you in a mess, because if you come against me, you're coming against God, because I'm speaking God's word. And that's what I was thinking about when I read this, because when you drop down, beginning in verse 16, he says, Now hear the word of the Lord. You say, Do not prophesy against Israel, and do not preach against the house of Isaac. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. And now he's going to pronounce judgment on Amaziah, just personally. And he says, Your wife will be a prostitute in the city. Your sons and daughters will fall by the sword. Your land will be divided up with a measuring line. And you yourself will die on pagan soil. And Israel will certainly go into exile from its homeland. And I ask myself, why was judgment so hard against Amaziah? Why? I mean, why didn't God just strike Amaziah down and be done with it? Why this curse on his wife, on his children? Why tell him all of this other stuff? And the reason is, is because what I just said, if you mess with God's anointed, you're messing with God himself. 
one of the signs of God's prophet, of a true prophet, is what he says comes to pass, just like he says it. There's no generalities. There's no, well, maybe, not like what you hear from the prophets today, none of that. When he speaks this prophecy against Amaziah, it's going to happen exactly the way God said. And so when you come against God's anointed, be it a prophet, be it the leader that God has put over you, be it your pastor, whoever, you come against God. Because God has put them there. God has placed them there. Uh, a couple of examples real quick. And one that was brought up here just a couple of weeks ago is Elisha and the bears. When the youth, and the, some translations say children, some say youth. When, the, when whoever it was, when they came out and they made fun of Elisha. The reason that God struck him down like he did is because to come against Elisha was to come against God. Because God, Elisha was speaking God's word. He was doing exactly what God told him. And then another incident is back in number chapter 12. And you remember that at one point Miriam and Aaron, who were Moses' brother and sister, they came to Moses and they said, look, you're running around here acting like you're somebody, like you're the only one God speaks to. You know, you're, you're, you're not that bad, Moses. God speaks to us. God shows us things too. And Moses said, well, all right. He said, I'll tell you what. He said, meet me in the morning out front the gate of the tabernacle and we'll let God decide. Well, the next morning, Miriam had leprosy. God struck her. Now, he healed her later on. But he struck her. And the reason being, and that's where God made that little speech that I quoted to you here a while back in one of our other teachings. God says that to most people, to most prophets, he said, I speak in riddles, I speak in dreams. And that's the way he was speaking to Miriam and to Aaron. But he said to Moses, you remember how he said he spoke to Moses? Face to face, like a friend to a friend. And then to paraphrase, God said, how dare you come against my man? And again, she had leprosy. Aaron suffered some things later on in particular. He didn't get to go into the promised land either. He died and was buried before they got there. So it's not a good thing. And that's why Amaziah is judged so hard. And that's why we see these things that the Lord tells him. And then chapter 8 is there any questions up to now? Any comments? And then chapter 8 is the fourth vision, and the whole chapter, which is just 14 verses, is the vision. And it's the vision of, of what is called summer fruit or ripe fruit, if you're using one of the older translations. And it says, the Lord God showed me this, a basket of summer fruit or ripe fruit. And he asked me, he said, what do you see, Amos? And I replied, a basket of summer fruit. The Lord said to me, and here's the answer, the end has come from my people Israel, and I will no longer spare them. So this, this summer fruit, it's the end of year fruit. It's, it's the last harvest of the fruit that they're going to have that year. And one of the things that I've read, which fits the purpose here, is it has a short edible life. Once you pick it, you got to eat it pretty quick or, or it ruins and, and it's no use. And so I believe he's showing through Amos, he's showing Israel that the time is short. You're like this basket of summer fruit. You've been harvested and your time is short. Judgment is coming. And notice well, again what he said. He said, uh, verse one, he's, verse two, he said, the end has come. And here's the phrase for my people. Again, he's reminding them, my people, you're my people. You remember in Daniel, and I believe it's chapter 12. Yeah, Daniel chapter 12. You read through 9, 10, and 11, all the things that's going to happen to Israel. And some of it is, is so upsetting that Daniel, he, he puts these little phrases in there like he said, I was pale. I was without strength. I was basically, it made me sick to my stomach to see what was going to happen 
to the nation of Israel. And then in chapter 12 and verse 1, Gabriel tells him, he says, now look, at that time, when, when all this is over and it's time for God's restoration, he says, at that time, Michael, the great prince who stands watch over your people, will rise up. I think that's what God's telling them. He's saying, look, you're still my people. You got a lot of judgment to go through. You got a lot of pain. You got a lot of suffering that's coming. And, and it's going to be a difficult time. But you're still my people. And when we get to chapter 9, we're going to see the promise that he makes to them of future restoration. But now he's telling them, he says, the end has come. And then he uses a phrase. Look, if you would, in verse 3. In the Christian standard, it's the, the first phrase. It says, in that day. Okay, now, what, what do I tell you about any time you read in that day or, or at that time? When, what day? You need to find out when he's talking about so you don't go to applying things to one period of time that don't apply. And you, get, you stay straight. So what he's talking about here is the immediate judgment that's coming to them. In that day, it's the same phrase as the day of the Lord. And so he's telling them that the day of the Lord is coming on you, the day of God's judgment. Now, if you remember, back in chapter 5, we had that passage beginning in verse 18 where he says, Woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. Okay, well, the Lord's telling them, all right, here it comes. Judgment is coming upon you. In this case, the day of the Lord is very near for them, and it would be the coming invasion of the Assyrians. And now, beginning in verse 4 through verse 14, he tells them about the morning that they're going to endure, what's going to happen to them. And if you'll notice, there are two things that's going to happen about the morning. Number one is they're going to mourn because of all of the dead bodies. When the Assyrians invade, they're going to be, no telling how many of them are going to be slaughtered during the invasion, and then the rest of them are going to be taken out. And he says you're going to mourn because of all the dead bodies. But then the second reason that they're going to mourn is because of a divine silence. When Assyria comes, what are they going to do? Same thing everybody else does. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. We repent. We'll turn back. Oh, Lord, stop this. And the Lord says, notice that he uses the word there at the end of verse 3. He said, many dead, dead bodies thrown everywhere. Silence. The Lord says, I'm not going to answer you because it's time. Your judgment has come. Now, if you'll turn on over and if you look down into uh, verse 11, he kind of furthers this prophecy. And he says, look, the days are coming. And this is the declaration of the Lord God. When I will send a famine through the land, not a famine of bread or a thirst for water, but of the hearing of the words of the Lord. So they're going to do just like everybody else. They're going to start screaming and yelling. And Can you imagine in the days of Noah when the water started rising, how many people repented? How many people were hanging on the side of that ark trying to get in? What was the answer? Time's up. You had your opportunity. People, verse 12, people will stagger from sea to sea and roam from north to east, seeking the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. Why? Final judgment. It's it. It's over. This is the day of the Lord. And folks, the, the world that we live in, we have a, a time limit set on us too. We don't know when it is. I think we're getting close. We can look at the signs, the season around us, but there's going to come a day when God's going to say, that's it. Today is the day. And it's going to be over for those that had rejected him. That's what's happened to them. And he, he gives them all kinds of things. If you read that passage, I'm not going to. 
Uh, beginning in verse 4, as I said through verse 14, he explains to them exactly what they're going to do, exactly what they're going to go through. And, and I'll just share something with you. I found this interesting. Uh, what, what Verse um, 9, and in that day, this is the declaration of the Lord, I will make the sun go down at noon, and I will darken the land in the daytime. And uh, I did some digging, did some Googling and some researching, and Jeroboam 2 reigned from 793 to 753, and you can Google this and verify it yourself. In uh, 784 and in 763 B.C., there were uh, eclipses in the Middle East. So I think that's what God used. Somebody asked me just yesterday, they asked me what I thought about all this weather and everything and right now there's another uh, volcano that's going off in Indonesia uh, there's flooding in parts of the world heavy flooding the mudslide in, in Papua New Guinea the death toll is over 2,000 now uh, the weather we're having here you said the death toll was seven yesterday it was 21 the day before through Oklahoma Arkansas uh, it just keeps going on I think it's God's judgment I, I think God is, is trying to wake us up I really do. And they said, well, don't you think it's global warming? Oh, yeah. I said, well, I'm going to tell you what I think about global warming. I said, first of all, I don't believe in global warming the way that the government's presenting it to us. I think that's a joke. But I said, yes, I believe that possibly it is global warming. And I think that's what God is using to set up the world to move into what's going to happen in the tribulation period. And they said, well, what are you talking about? And I said, well, you go back and you read some of the other battles in the Old Testament. And there'll be a lot of times that Israel was ab about to fight somebody. And God would send an earthquake. And they would say, well, that earthquake just happened. I said, yeah, but I said, tell me how that earthquake happened over here. And it swallowed up all their enemies and not a single one of Israel fell into the earthquake. And they just kind of looked at me. And I said, I'm going to tell you what, I said, it's going to happen again. Because God says in Zechariah that he's going to use an earthquake when all the enemies come against Israel. And so I think a lot of what we're seeing, just like what they see, even though we might look at it and say, oh, that's just a, a natural phenomenon. I think it's God. God's in control of all of nature. He's using everything. And even right now, I asked Rusty about this here a couple of weeks ago. We're having some of the most serious sunstorms that they've ever recorded in history. And they're warning us that there could be, because of these sunstorms, there could be loss of communications, blackouts, various things for short periods of time. And they say that some of it has already happened. I, I, don't, I don't know. I haven't lost communications, and you know, but that's what they're saying. So you think God can really do that? Well, yeah, verse 5, or vision 5, beginning in chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. And where does Amos see God standing? By the altar. Why? Because he is God. And nobody else can stand by that altar but God like he does. And what does he prophesy is going to happen? Destruction of all the false temples and judgment on the people. And then in verse 4, look at that phrase. I told you about this just a while ago. In verse 4, he says, I will keep my eye on them. Everybody says, oh, wow, yay, yay. I will keep my eye on them for harm and not for good. Why? Final day. Judgment. Now, keep in mind, we're talking to Israel. And what we're going to see next week is the prophecy of future restoration. And, and I think when you go back up to the, the first two visions where he, he spared them, he, he said, okay, I'm going to hold that. The, I'm going to hold the locust back, and I'm going to... I think maybe he was giving them a hint. And he was saying, yeah, Israel, you're fixing to go into judgment, and many of you are going to be destroyed. But there's going to be, remember this word, a remnant. There's always going to be a remnant. Because God has a purpose for Israel. And the purpose that we are looking for is for Israel to be back in the land, to have the temple, to be established, 
and to receive their Messiah when he comes back from heaven. So is judgment coming? Yep. There's nothing they can do about it. But there's hope because God promises. God made a covenant that he would restore them and they would be back in the land. Well, what about you and me? Well, we're going to see some hard times. And not necessarily just from persecution, just from living in, in this world. We're going to see some hard times. We're going to get older. Things are going to change. But then you think about the world today and the way the world's turning, the way the world's changing. Uh, three countries this past week have recognized uh, Palestine as a state. And, of course, it's not official yet, but, but they have started the ball rolling. There's not a single nation in the country today that is 100% behind Israel. Not 100%. Even us. We're waffling. And they found out Tuesday why Biden didn't want them to go into Rafa. Did y'all hear about it? They found a bunch of tunnels. Some of the tunnels led to Egypt, and in those tunnels were munitions that we had sold to Egypt, and Egypt was funneling them to Hamas. That's why Biden didn't want them to go, because he knew they would find that. Everybody's against Israel. The more it turns against Israel, the more it's going to turn against us, the children of God. But there's the promise of Christ coming for us. There's the promise of eternal life if we are in Christ Jesus. Amen? I hope everybody is in Christ Jesus. Everybody that's listening to this too. If you're not, you need to get saved tonight. Any questions? Any comments? Next week will be